Well, thank you, Dave. And it, it's, it's a pleasure to be here to share some of our, our thinking and some of the things that are, are driving us uh, and motivating us uh, in our work. Um, and so I'm actually, um, what I've titled this presentation is called Design for Social Impact. And I've started to shift uh, the discussion, at least in my head, because a lot of these things just bounce around in my head for a while, uh, from social sustainability to social impact. Because I'm starting to think that social sustainability um, gets uh, caught up in, in some of the rhetoric that, that actually I'm going to be talking about. Um, so I'm actually talking, going to talk more about using our work as a vehicle for social impact than I am about social sustainability per se, but it's really, really closely, closely aligned. Uh, as, as Dave mentioned, this has come from uh, really about a 20-year uh, body of work uh, in community facilities that, that has influenced our thinking and has led to, uh, for us, some conclusions or some questions probably more specifically about what is important and what can we achieve through, through our work. So uh, this was a pool in, in uh, Langley, uh, from about uh, late 90s, uh, West Vancouver Community Center, uh, Whistle Public Library. I know some people here know it uh, know it pretty well, uh, as as with uh, with Hillcrest uh, as well. So a, a lot of public buildings, a lot of public, and as Dave suggested, spaces where that sort of third space have been really really important to to the to the discussion. Uh, libraries in Edmonton, um, but I want to start with. With, with this, and um, for me, you can distill the history of architecture into one very, very simple concept and describe it in, in three, three slides. And the first one is the fire. And, and, I, and it's, my, it's my belief that the first act, architectural act was somebody deciding to roll some stones together to create a hearth, to create a place where people could share a fire. And you know the purposes of that fire were both you know, uh, met basic needs in terms of safety and heat and warmth, but there was also that uh, ability to come together at the end of the hunt or whatever it is and, and share the stories and to support one another. And so there was that duality of the physical need and the social need that we first came together around a campfire. It then met its highest form, in my view, in the Italian Renaissance, you know, where so much of what we think about as public space, truly, truly democratic, uh, an open public space uh, was created, uh, you know, spaces that were, were for all, uh, were for all aspects of life, from birth to death, to celebrations, to executions, to wars, you name it, everything took place in these spaces. And that was really important. And then what we've done with that notion of public space is we've given it over to the private realm, and we've created pseudo public space, and, and really best represented by the shopping mall. You know, this notion of, of space that is, is open to the public provided that you meet the particular criteria that has been established as what is acceptable behavior and acceptable citizenship in that space. And to me, that's a real shame. We need to get back to creating truly public spaces and spaces that are, are, are available for all, all of society. So that's just a bit of an introduction to really what I want to talk about is, is why, why design for social impact and why, why should we be concerned about this? And for me, this is a really uh, important um, passage from a book uh, by Andrew Ross called Bird on Fire. And this is a book that discusses the uh, city of Phoenix, Arizona from a sustainability standpoint. And if you know Phoenix, um, you know, it's this vast, you couldn't set out to design a less sustainable uh, city uh, except perhaps someplace like Dubai. But um, it, it, it breaks all of the rules in terms of, of what, is, what is appropriate. And so anyways, this book desc describes it, but there's some really important things that come out of, uh, come out of this. And, and the first one is really just noting that our approach to averting climate change, uh, which I think we're all committed to, um, is really an experiment, and it's a social experiment. We don't really know the end result of the path we're on. We know it's really serious. We know we have to take it seriously, and we're trying to do what's right. We're trying to, but it really is an experiment in, in decision making and whether or not our political tools actually have the ability to make the kind of change necessary to, to ensure our, our survival as a species. Much, you're probably all familiar with this notion of sustainability as a three-legged stool, environmental, economic, and social, but this is really what most discussion around sustainability looks like right now. 
you know, most of our energy, most of our attention, uh, our resources goes towards the environmental side of things. And, and that's, that's for a lot of reasons. It's, you know, it's, we gravitate to the thing that's easier to understand, easier to describe, easier to measure. And many of the, the things that we're doing in environmental sustainability uh, involve metrics that we, so it's energy modeling. We can measure it, we can understand uh, the differences, the shades of gray between high performance and lower, and lower performance. We have a much harder time in, in the social side of things. And so there's an imbalance. We're not creating a three-legged stool. We are creating a one-legged stool in, a, in our sustainability discussion as it's currently uh, being uh, held. So as Dave mentioned and I referred to, West Vancouver Community Centre for us was a really pivotal project on a number of fronts. This is a LEED Gold certified project. Uh, ticks all the boxes in terms of, of contemporary sustainability features from from PV to geothermal to district energy to fresh air, natural light, uh, really, really well-performing building. But what we recognized when the building opened was that it was performing socially probably more effectively than it was environmentally. Uh, it surprised us. The depth of its impact from a social standpoint really caught us off, off guard. And we were trying to create that, but it exceeded our expectations. And we are trying to understand what it is about that, that project that, that was resonating with the community in that way and how do we do more of that. So this was kind of, and around the same time, uh, I attended a conference and actually Mark Bussey was here, was one of the organizers, the organizer for this, the chair of this conference was Eichel Grata Design Week. Uh, one of my interests is multidisciplinary design and looking at design discussions from different, different design disciplines. And this was a communications design conference, a global conference um, that was held in Vancouver. Very, very interesting uh, moment. Cameron Sinclair, who at the time had, uh, was uh, in charge of architecture for humanity, gave a really in inspirational talk. And at the end of that talk, some, it was a typical Q&A session, and I'll, I remember it vividly. Uh, there was a fellow from India who got up and said, you know, his question was, it was more of a statement, um, something to the effect of, you know, this is all fine, but where I'm from, over the next 20 years, there's going to be half a billion new automobiles entering into the network. And so he made this statement, and it kind of resonated around the room. The room went silent for a while. And you start thinking, half a billion automobiles. Well, wow, that's, that's a pretty big number. And then quite quickly, the room went back to its typical conversation. And this really caught my attention. So I said, wait a minute, something is going on here. We're so caught up in... In, in the rhetoric of sustainability, and, and believe me, at this communications conference, it could have been an architectural or engineering conference. The words were different. They were talking about inks and papers, but the rhetoric was exactly the same. I thought, wait a minute, something, something, this is something we need to pay attention to. And so I said, I have to understand this issue better. I have to, I have to get to the bottom of this half a billion automobiles. And what does this mean for us in our work? So, I did some digging, and to be honest, I wasn't able to find the stat. I wasn't able to find that there's a 500 million automobiles entering into the system, but I was able to find from the World Bank 200, 200 million. Um, and I thought, well, that's still a pretty big number. I'm going to use the more conservative analysis. I'll use the 200, uh, 200 million new automobiles by the year uh, 2040. And try to understand, of course, this is right on the heels of the West Vancouver uh, Community Center. And what I, what's, what I realized was that when I look at that, and I look at the sort of metrics on, on comparing a car and its greenhouse gas emissions, um, it's one car entering the system every five seconds. And when I compare the impact of that to the savings that we, we achieved over years of hard work, multidisciplinary hard work, integrated design, for one, our one lead project, that the entire uh, reduction uh, from the West Vancouver Community Center was offset every eight minutes. So in the, in the length of time I've been speaking, um, four or five years of all of the consultant team's work to reduce carbon from that project has been eliminated twice by what's happening in that one metric in that, in that one country in the world. I don't, I'm not picking on India. I use that example because that's, that was the example that was given in, in, in that, in that conference. So this was, this was a bit of an earth-shattering moment for me because I started thinking, well, wait a minute. If this is true, what does this mean? How can we have the same conversation about where we're putting our priorities that we've been having? 
And it, it led, it's led to what has been now several years of challenging and questioning and trying to reestablish a, an equilibrium uh, uh, about priorities and an equilibrium about, about ensuring that we're putting our energies where we're going to maximize our impact that we have, have on the community. Because, you know, contrary to our good friend Buckminster Fuller, we don't live in a bubble. Uh, and if we're serious about averting climate change, we should be just as concerned about the carbon that's pumped into the atmosphere in other parts of the world as we are, as we are locally. So it really raises the question, are we doing enough? Are we doing enough and are we do it, doing it fast enough? And if not, then what, what aren't we doing that we should be doing or could be doing to help deal with the impacts of, of, of what's coming? And for me, um, it, it, it requires a shift, and not, uh, to an expansion of focus to include in a much more serious way discussions about resilience. Uh, because not only are we equipped to deal with performance of our buildings, but we're very well equipped to deal with um, the ability of our work to influence uh, the capacity within our community to be resilient. You know, we're inundated with systems. We were just discussing a, a, new, a new system. They come up all the time. Um, we're, we're all familiar with the term greenwashing and this notion that, that, that um, it's so easy to make a claim, it's so hard to back it up. And it's also hard to know if that claim actually has substance, if, if it has depth, if it is meaningful as it's being made. So I do a lot of traveling for work. And I was in Edmonton. This is the Westin Hotel in Edmonton, if anyone wants to shame them. Um, I got up in the morning to have my shower, and this is what I'm confronted with. I say, what is this crazy? Con I did not make this up. You can't make this up. Right? What is this insane contraption in, in my shower? And then I saw the little sign. Right? And the sign gives me the peace of mind to know that you know, I've made such a contribution to the environment by turning off one of the two shower heads. <laughs> but if I really wanted to have the full heavenly experience, I could turn on that second shower head. Wow. It's like, really? Wow. You know, we are inundated. Here's another one. We're, we're inundated with these messages, and we don't challenge them. We're not critical enough about the rhetoric that we see around us. Save the environment one napkin at a time. So I guess if I use two, I'm going to save even more of the environment. If I use ten, or like clearly, it's hyperbole. In in in, um, but we need to be more critical. We can't just accept these statements. We can't accept them being thrown out there and giving them weight that they don't have. We need to be far more critical. And it's true of our own work uh, uh, as well. So I'm not going to pick on lead too much, um, but I am going to pick on it a little bit. I really, uh, it was a really, one of early lead accredited professionals um, before the days of CAGBC, um, and it's done some tremendous things. So I, I, I'm not as critical of, of lead as it might appear when you hear what I have to say next. I really am advocating for a more critical stance about some of the claims that are made. So this is, this is an image that I, I took from the CAGBC website, which is, which I thought was pretty interesting because these are the statistics that they trumpet on their website as being significant. And I start to think, well, you know, big numbers, 1.6 million equivalent megawatt hours, you know, that sounds pretty big. Um, but I started digging into these, these numbers a, a little bit uh, more carefully. And again, using the analogy of the cars in India, um, you know, using their numbers, it's taken off the equivalent over this eight year period when I did this research was, was 60,000 cars off the road for one year. So that's about 7,300 cars uh, per year. That's the cumulative effect of the LEED uh, certified projects in Canada. This is a couple years old, so it's bigger than that now, but you get the point. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny number. It really is, is tiny. Around the same time, there's an article in the um, Vancouver Sun. Uh, this might even be one of your projects. I don't know if you guys are involved in the conversion of the central steam plant to a different fuel source. And this one act of changing the fuel source of the, what is now Creative Energy steam plant was the equivalent of 14,000 cars off the road. One systems decision, twice the impact of the collective efforts of the green building movement in lead projects in Canada. It's systemic change where we're going to get our big wins. If we're serious about averting climate change, 
we need to be advocates for much deeper wins. We need big wins. Our work in our buildings is not enough. We need to use our voices, we need to use our expertise to advocate for much, much deeper change than the path we're currently on. That's the conclusion that I've come to. Especially when you see things like this. Uh, and this is a satellite image of the flaring of the waste uh, products of, of the fracking process in North Dakota. Um, and you can literally see it at night from, from space. Um, this uh, 4.5 million metric tons, roughly the equivalent of adding 1 million cars per year. 1 million. You, the earliest, the earliest statistic was 7,000. So you can see in waste that is a byproduct of gaining all this material that we're now burning in other forms is swamping the collective work of the, of the green building movement. What, this raises some questions for me, and I think it should raise questions for all of us in terms of how are we going to shift our focus? How are we going to enhance our focus to, in the face of, of, of this? Of course, we, we have our own uh, things that we should be paying attention to as well. And of course, the oil sands. Um, some of the statistics around the oil sands are, are really, really staggering when you consider that all of the sectors of the Canadian economy that are working to reduce GHG emissions are offset by the expansion of, of, of uh, oil sands production. Again, systemic change. If we were advocating for different approaches, different systems, uh, we would have far more impact than we're having uh, at, at the moment. So essentially, the entire increase in Canada's emissions between 2005 and 2020 is actually more, like the increase in the oil sands Imp the increase in oil sands production impact is about three times what is projected to be Canada's net increase in GHDs. So it gives you an idea of the scale differential between what we're able to deal with uh, and, and what the, the real problem is. So really, for us, the truth is, and this is, this is a hard one to come to terms with, is that the, you know, the increase per year in the oil sands projections, 120 time, 125 times all of the aggregate of lead buildings in Canada. This is really significant. We love to use the low-hanging fruit uh, analogy when we're talking about integrated design, and, and the reality is, is that when we look at what we've, how we've shifted our industry, we've taken the low-hanging fruit. We've taken the easy wins. How are we going to bridge that gap with the things that are hard? So a couple of years ago, we, we, we really thought peak oil was going to save us, right? That, that production was going to squeeze it and the price was just going to keep going. And that was going to make all of these other alternative forms of energy economical. Um, and that was going to cause the shift in the marketplace that would get this the big wins, right? We're not talking about peak oil anymore, <coughs> with, with good reason. Um, it's gone the other way. And what what the oil producing uh, sector has been, become very good at is extracting more and more energy, uh, often at more and more damage. Um, so if we're waiting for this to save us, it's not, it's not going to do that. So another little, another little story. Now, some of these, what I just showed you is a couple years out of date. Now we know what's happened with the price of oil. At the time, we didn't. And so the next little story I want to tell is about Shell and their impact. Um, not picking on Shell necessarily, except that there was this article in February of this year that said Shell decided to pull the plug on its long-delayed Pierre River uh, oil sands mine. Articles like this are happening all the time. We're hearing about the decrease in production. Um, but when you look at the scale of, of this, it's 200,000 barrels a day project. Um, I'll get back to that. But we know why it's happening, you know, in terms of the price curve. The price curve is, is cost. The irony for us is that while we once may have thought that high oil, was going, high oil prices were going to save us, it's low oil prices is actually helping, from a Canadian perspective, helping Canada meet its international commitments, which is really ironic really, really ironic that the lower oil goes and the less likely that the oil sands projects are to be developed, the easier it will be for Canada to meet its 
you know, whatever target we ultimately agree to uh, accept. The, the swings that occur in these types of sectors are so much greater than, than what we have the ability to control. This, this is just that oil price curve. You know, we were here, right, when we thought peak oil was going was gonna to save us. It was just going to keep going. When you look at the, the normalized price uh, when, in, in December 2014 dollars, um, there actually hasn't been that much fluctuation in the actual you know, real value price of oil. And I'm not sure we should be expecting significant change in the, in the, in the horizon that we should be concerned about. Again, when we look at the numbers, when we look at the, the contribution from the uh, oil sands versus buildings, um, and then when you, when you bisect and you dissect the building to actually those things that are with the types of projects that collectively we, we have an influence on, it's a very small slice. This is a big slice. And in fact, this one, this one um, cancellation, again, was about 150 um, times the aggregated value of lead uh, projects in Canada. <coughs> We're also not asking ourselves some of the really challenging questions about what is it that we're actually sustaining. Are, are, we, are we looking for a world that is, is equitable and that uh, is balanced? Or are we looking to protect an imbalance? Are we looking to protect a standard of living, a quality of life that we've really become comfortable with? And one that maybe we can't afford from a planetary perspective. One of the stats that never gets discussed is, is our expectations around home size. We hear a lot, there was an article again in the paper this morning about, about uh, the crisis in affordability of homes. Well, from 1975 to 2010, um, and some of these dates don't quite align, but it's close enough, you'll get the point. In 1975, and, and many of us in this room grew up in a, you know, a suburban house of about 1,000 square feet, the average House size in Canada in 1975 was 1,050 square feet. You know, it's, it's a typical um, bungalow. They were built all across the country. By 2010, the average house size is about almost, do almost double, 1,950 square feet. Now, we haven't gotten bigger, right? Um, I don't know why our needs have doubled, but we've come to not want a house that's twice as big as our parents. We've come in to expect it and, and demand it. Why is that? Why is it that that that, that has become the norm? Um, that is 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 what we're all uh, expecting policy, public policy, to, to deliver uh, to us. At the same time as the house size has increased, the average occupants per person, uh, occupants per house is, is decreased. Families are getting smaller, not bigger. So at the same time that the house size has almost doubled. The number of people living within that house has gone from three and a half to two and a half. So when you look at the, the square foot per person, it's actually almost, uh, well, it's 260% larger in, in, that, in, in a generation. Like, we need, and, and of course, if you could go back over the last 20 years and rebuild all of the housing that's being built in Canada, let's say 75% of its current size, 50% increase on 1975. Think of what the environmental footprint and impact would be of, 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 that, of that type of decision. It would be far greater than, than what we're doing in terms of, 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 of clawing away at, um, at you know, institutional buildings and, and, and multifamily residential. And of course, at the same time, not only has our way of living has changed dramatically as well, there's far more technology um, this is a disturbing one. In 1990, now these are slightly different dates, but 1990, 23% of occupied force floor space was cooled. 46% is now cooled. We've got far more devices. We've got far more demand for energy uh, than we did. So the effect of our lifestyle has not only is multiplied both from a physical standpoint, but from an energy standpoint as well. I, I hear very few people questioning that there's an underlying assumption in the sustainability discussion that we don't have to change that much, that we need a technological fix that is just going to allow us to continue to live the way we, we do. Now, I hope that's true. I'm not convinced it is. But what's more important is that we should be having the discussion. We should be questioning 
and, and having um, a thorough discussion about, about some of these, because this is where the big wins are. This is the systemic change. Really our greatest challenge is, is transforming the way we live and transforming the suburbs. Because that's from a North American and actually much of the, much of the certainly the developed world, we've, we've imprinted both on our, from a physical sense and an emotional sense, a way of living that may not be supportable. But we're not willing to question it. We're still looking for that technological fix. And I, and I think that is getting in the way of actually, remember we, I started the talk by saying that we're all committed to averting climate change. Well, if we were serious about averting climate change, we would be asking the deeper questions, the tougher questions, the ones that are gonna have more impact uh, through our work. There's a lot of talk about a housing bubble, and people, you know, I believe there is a housing bubble, but it's not the one that people are expecting. It's not, it's not a bubble that all of a sudden house prices are, are going to uh, vanish. It's a bubble of, of affordability. It's a bubble of expectations. And then at some point, those lines on the graph are gonna converge, and it's gonna, it's gonna become completely clear that we cannot sustain the arc that we're on in terms of expectations around the way we live. And that's, that bubble is coming, um, mark my words. So what, is this, what does this mean? What does all this mean? Well, it, me it means, referring back to Andrew Ross, that, and again, the next thing I draw out of this quote is that success, again, if, if climate, averting climate change and is, is our goal, success will not be determined primarily by large technological fixes. And that's really what we've been looking for. Though many will be needed along the way, it's not like we should be ignoring these things, but it's not enough on its own. Just as decisive to the outcome is whether or not our social relationships, cultural beliefs, and political customs will allow for the kinds of changes that are, that are necessary. This, this is really, really key for me, is are we equipped, at, you know, from a societal standpoint, to accept the type of change and the depth of change that may be necessary? And this is really why the climate crisis is as much social as it is biophysical. We've been treating it, uh, frankly, no offense, but like an engineering problem, right? There's an end, the solution, we just have to get there in a straight line. This is a far more complex issue. So really, the conclusion that we've come to as a firm is that it's time to change our thinking and to expand our thinking. We must advocate for, for deeper change. Um, and we need to expand our, our focus. We need to expand from um, high performance, the notions of high performance, to include a much broader uh, set of criteria and a much broader set of, of, of priorities and help our communities in the face of climate change. So one of the questions that is probably bouncing around your head, I know I've grappled with it, is this question of is high performance Im important or is it a distraction? And, and I think um, I may be just justifying this in my mind, just to feel good about the efforts that we're doing, but I think it's both. Uh, I think that it, it continues to be critical that the work that we do uh, is um, making as much of a contribution as we can. But it's also a distraction, because in, in so many respects, the effectiveness of what we've done from a performance standpoint is masking the fact that the, pr the scale of the problem is much bigger than perhaps we, we think it is, or that our impact isn't as great as we'd like to think it is. Uh, and so, yes, it's important, but it also is, is getting in the way of, of asking those, those deeper questions. So, with that, I'm gonna be a bit more positive about some of the things that we're doing once we've, we've accepted, the, now, for us, if you accept that we need to expand our influence and our ability to impact the community and society effectively, and I, and I believe all of us in this room and in our, in our sector has, has huge potential to, to help. Um, we look at it across the whole spectrum of our practice, both in terms of our projects, uh, but also, and as importantly right now for us, is what we're using how, how we're using the firm as a vehicle for change, and how we're using the, the operation of the firm and the energy of the firm and the potential of the firm 
to have impact beyond that of our projects. So I'm going to talk more about that. Um, if I had more time, I could talk what we're doing from a project level and how, how this thinking has shifted our thinking from a project standpoint. But I'm, I'm, if there's time for questions, I'd be happy to talk about that. But I'm going to talk about some of the other things that, that we're doing. Um, so of course, when you, when you, when you s set out to maximize your social impact through your work, the first question you have to understand is, well, how do I measure it? And I've, I've talked to those in the social sciences and people will say, of course you can measure it. And I've had others say, well, why would you even try? It's not, it's not like we can put a, a meter onto it and measure what's flowing through that pipe or, or through that wire. Um, so the, social, the health of a community from a social standpoint is a very, very different, very, very different thing. How do you measure the effectiveness of that? You know, you hear the kids laughing and the joy that, you know, like happiness is a really elusive uh, elusive thing. How do, you, how do you measure scales of happiness? Um, now, the social sciences do, do um, deal with that. And in fact, um, some economic analysts have, have looked at this as well. Dow Jones has measured from an economic standpoint the value of, of social sustainability. So it, it, it is possible. It's just really, really hard. We've, um, we did... Uh, um, as Dave mentioned, we, uh, we, the firm developed a, a course at UBC School of Architecture on social sustainability. And uh, in our research for this, one of the things we looked at was different ways of understanding, modeling, and describing it. And what we discovered was a really, really complex. But we liked this diagram. And interestingly enough, most of, the, most of the research we came across was in the UK. But the example they gave was from the city of Vancouver. And this was... A, an analysis of social sustainability done for the Southeast Falls Creek before it was the Olympic Village, that they took in their way of understanding it and described it you know, through principles, indicators of success, and then a series of, of themes. But you can see the complexity uh, of, of the model that, that emerges. So we didn't find that particularly helpful in day-to-day -day practice. So for us, we've developed our own model. We, and what we call it is the social... I guess I've got to rephrase that, the social impact framework. And we borrowed the city of Vancouver's principles. We thought they were really sound. Um, and so it's, it's found on this layer of principles, equity, social inclusion, security, and adaptability. If we're serious about a sustainable society, we have to be serious about questions of equity and about social inclusion and security. If we're truly going to have a sustainable society, everyone needs to be welcome. And so for us, in establishing the basis in terms of the principles, this provides us with a number of things. It gives us the ability to do research, first and foremost. We can look at, we can look at these things and say, equity. How can we influence equity through our work? Uh, so, but it also opens up the need, which is really critical, to collaborate with the social sciences, you know, whether it be social anthropology, sociology, <coughs> applied. Like, there's all kinds of social sciences where they are dealing with this every day. We need to get better at talking to them and understanding them. Um, we need to treat the standards that we've come to accept as the requirement as a floor. And we've done that in certain aspects, but we haven't done it in a lot of socially minded and social impact uh, criteria. For me, I really enjoy what's happening in, in planning. Um, the planners are far more accepting of the social impact of their work than we are in the architectural and engineering world. They are engaging in this, in this discussion uh, far more comfortably, and we need to be part of it. We need, to, we, need to, uh, we need to be part of that discussion. So on top of the principles, we have our processes. So as I mentioned earlier that we're looking at not only how we do our work and what we do in our work, but how we do it. And so the processes are the things we do uh, could be now. This is thinking of it more of a project, but if we think of it as the firm, what are the things that we're doing as a firm that can influence the indicators of, of social uh, sustainability? So some of the things we're already doing, much of these things we're already doing, but maybe not with the focus that we need. You know, there are our engagement processes, participatory design, governance is something we get involved with. In fact, the West Vancouver project, part of the outcome of the project was a governance structure of community governance for that facility. Feedback and evaluation. Uh, we, need, we need to get serious about that whole life cycle of, 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 of the project. So this, again, this is focused on how rather than the what, 
and we need to we need to be thinking of it long before the project starts and long after the project uh, finishes as well. And we must we we have to allow ourselves to be vulnerable, and allow that we don't have all the answers. That if by opening up the discussion and and allowing uh, others in, um, it, it will enhance the the the, the solution. Post occupancy evaluation. Uh, this is an example. Um, is one that we only as a sector give lip service to far too often. Uh, too often I find that people are afraid to go back to their buildings and talk to the operator and find out what's working and what's not working because they don't, they don't, want, to, they don't want to necessarily know. Uh, and this is a hindrance to, to improving uh, and, and, and improving as a, as a sector. And at the top of the framework is, is the products or the design strategies. And we have given a lot of thought to the design strategies. So these are the physical solutions that lead to, uh, that have social impact. So again, these are physical. Um, you, you, part of you might be saying, well, you know, th this isn't anything new. And the reality is it isn't. We're doing many of these things. However, we're doing them with a different focus and with a different lens. And we're not doing them with, with, with a real strong purpose and desire to, to maximize our, our social impact. But really importantly, we need to understand what success looks like. We need to be able to measure it, uh, or at least understand it if we can't, we can't uh, measure it. So I'm going to give you an example, and it, it hits to this last one. Is, is You've probably all seen programming diagrams. Um, and this is how, this is how the, pr the requirements of projects are communicated, at least to us as architects. You know, the programmers will come and it's a, it's a diagram flowchart with the spaces and the relationships. And, and it, leads to, it leads to very conventional solutions. It leads to solutions that solve the functional need of each of these. We go into great depth and detail about each of these spaces and we solve those. But what we don't pay attention to is those spaces in between. We don't pay attention to where do people actually in. In fact, it doesn't even show up on the diagram. These lines, they're seen as places for movement. They're not seen as places for people to interact and get to know each other and help each other. So this is one example of a, of, of a, of a focus on a design strategy um, that has come out of this analysis, is really paying attention to what we refer to as the glue spaces. Because many of the social much of the social success that we see in projects doesn't happen in the gym, although it contributes. It doesn't happen in the classroom. It happens in the spaces in between the classrooms. It happens in, you know, the community in a school is built in the hallway. It's not built in the classroom. And the ministry doesn't fund it, right? So we have to find ways to uh, pay attention to those spaces in spite of the fact that our systems don't necessarily support them as directly as we'd like. You know, it's these types of spaces, these types of gathering spaces where, where parents can sit and have a coffee and, and watch, their, watch their kids or family member in an activity. Um, these are really, really important spaces. And whether it be a school or a community center, they play a very similar role. And, and I argue that it doesn't matter what type of building we're doing. It could be your office. You know, this, we all, you know, the talk of the, the coffee machine or the, or the water cooler, that's where teams come together. It's, the, it's those spaces in between um, that are absolutely critical. Libraries are, are, are another example. So we are looking at, at a whole array of, of, of strategies within the physical things that we're doing in our projects to, to look at social impact. But I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the things we're doing as, as a, using leveraging the, the power of the firm uh, and, and how we're experimenting and exploring how the firm can actually have impact outside of our traditional practice. And so some of these are some of the things that we're doing, some examples of some of the things we're doing. One thing that we've, um, we've done is we've created um, what we call TILT, which is a, our Curiosity Labs. And, and Mark Bussey, who's here, has recently joined HCMA uh, from a communication design background, is, is sort of our, our tilt, uh, TILT champion within, within the firm. Um, and this is a space of exploration. This is a non-client zone. This is not a fee-generating area. This is a place where we are going to gather up like-minded. Uh, we'd love to have the support of Integral, uh, by the way. Um, but where we're going to gather up um, uh, others that are concerned about social impact of our work. Um, 
under an umbrella of exploration, investigation, uh, using curiosity as a way of exploring um, and understanding our communities better. One of the things we've done is a artist in residence uh, program. And this was an installation at the Olympic Village Skytrain. Uh, so we have, uh, we've, we've had three or four now artists that we've collaborated with uh, to, again, put, put something out there into the community to cause conversation or to ask questions. We also get involved in, in events um, that are encouraged to get people to see their cities differently. Another one of our artists in residence was, was quite an interesting um, initiative. This was the Faraday Cafe. It was an installation in Chinatown two summers ago. Um, and the, the, Julian Thomas was the social artist that we work with and came up with an idea to build what is called a Faraday cage uh, as a cafe. So essentially uh, a cage where cell phone signals would not enter. So you had to be without your cell phone. And it was really about encouraging people to think about our relationship with technology and the relationship with all the devices that you know, we're all busy waiting to check when I'm stopped talking. Um, but it, it was a coffee and tea by donation event. But it was really, really interesting. And again, it asked people to, to think about what their life would be like without the internet, both you know, as a positive and as a, and, and as a negative. And it was really interesting. We collected all of the, all of the responses. Um, but it really got people talking. But what was really fascinating for us, and I was talking about leveraging the power of the firm. This was a really small thing that we did. Um, it caught fire. Before the cafe even opened, it was covered by all the national media. Uh, it was on BBC. It was on TV in Malaysia. Um, you know, this simple idea, this simple injection of an idea created a conversation that resonated not just on that street, not just locally, not just nationally, but internationally. And to us, this was really encouraging. Say that we're onto something here. You know, with this simple, it was a very small injection of cash that we, we put in a firm into this, this notion, this idea. And it caused a conversation that resonated around the world. So what it, what it demonstrates is the importance and the power of, of, of catalyst and the, the catalytic effect is that if we think it's, these issues are, are too big or we can't contribute to issues on a, on a, on a, on a global scale, it's wrong. You know, we just have to try. We have to put our opinions out there. We have to put our ideas out there and cause a conversation. Something will come of it. Not always, but sometimes. So part of what we're doing uh, uh, is, is also uh, helping to coordinate and sponsor events like Interesting Vancouver and Creative Mornings and, and, and others. Again, as, as really putting our um, uh, the weight of the firm and the efforts of the firm uh, into a variety of initiatives. One that we're really excited about that's coming up is called Tilt City. And this is a collaboration that we're doing with SFU Public Square. And some of you may be interested in participating in this. We'd love to have some people from your firm join this. This is going to be a day-long investigation of the city uh, as part of their annual uh, symposium that they have in November. But it came out of an idea that we had as a firm. When we, ent uh, as when we moved our, our office um, here in April, uh, we decided that we wanted to better understand our neighbors and our neighborhood and, and this, this context. And one thing we do every once in a while is do a thing called an HCMA day where we gather up the entire firm, our office in Vancouver, Victoria, and we, ta we tackle for a day-long exercise a, a, a question. And 
so Tilt City that we're doing with SFU is modeled on what we did as a firm back in April. And there's a, there's a quick video here that uh, will tell the story. Today is what we call HCMA Day. We do this uh, a few times a year where we gather up uh, the office, uh, two offices in Vancouver and Victoria, and, and come together to take on a question or a creative exercise. The only directive that we really gave them was activate your site. So they had to interpret what that meant. How does one activate? What is your site? These are all open for interpretation. And that is the exercise. We immediately came up with this idea of a dart game. So we printed out this map and we had people stand back and aim for some piece of property. And where people landed, that was their site for the day. They were thrown randomly into groups. We also randomized the budget for the day. Some groups got zero dollars. Another group at the opposite end got a hundred. Teams that have been formed of people within the office are striking out into the city and are going to intervene and try to make a difference. It's a space that's kind of seems to be pretty firmly connected into the, the city itself. What we're trying to think about is how can we get these people, instead of just passing through the site, to actually take part in the site or be a part of the site. Well, we have some big ideas. We really want to activate the water, but this then team, how do we do uh, their dart ended up in the water. We're thinking of building three dimensionally this tower so that it projects out onto the sidewalk. We're just working on the logistics of how we will make this happen. This is where all the action is happening uh, behind me, where the teams are gathering and developing the ideas and sharing the ideas that they came up with earlier when they were out on site. They're sketching, they're, they're working three-dimensionally, they're talking, they're debating, and it's a very intensive and quick and rapid design process and uh, really, really looking forward to seeing what happens uh, later this afternoon when everybody goes back out onto the street and implements uh, what they've come up with. It's sort of near the corner of Georgia and how near the uh, Hotel Georgia. They had a ten dollar budget, so they all had a sidewalk chalk. But you can see it was a whole series of different uh, efforts. It was it was tremendously uh, inspirational for our firm. This team had no money. They 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 established a flash mob of birds. They exceeded, I think, all of our expectations. I think everyone had a fabulous time. Everybody was able to take on the directive of activating their site and then work within the constraints and pull some work off that was truly remarkable. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we're, we're reconvening this as, a, as, a, uh, as an event, as part of SFU's Public Square. We'd love to have people interested in, in, in participating. It's going to be a really, really interesting day. Uh, that we're helping, uh, we're coordinating on behalf of, of SFU. Um, so anyways, examples of, 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 of the types of things that we're doing as a firm, um, because in the, in the face of, of this expanded belief about, about what we should be doing through our work and, and our firm, um, and really trying to tackle the whole array of, of, of what we do. And so we're, 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 we're looking at a whole series of different ways of of increasing the impact, uh, and then this is just some of them, and this is just some of them. But it's a couple of the ones we're really, really proud of. So I'm going to I'm going to conclude. I think I've used up more than my allotted time, um, and this is a really interesting quote um, that I that I that I it also resonates for me, and it really it really states that well, you know why can't we why can't we put human beings in the environment that supports life at the center of all design. And, and you know, we, we've been focusing on certain aspects of the environment, but we haven't necessarily um, uh, focused as broadly as I believe uh, we should. And then a final, a final thought, again, referring back to Andrew Ross, and, and this is where it gets really tough, um, that the solutions will have to be driven by a fuller quest for global justice than, than has been tolerated or imagined. And at some point, we're going to have to open ourselves up to the discussion of what this means. Is that will we continue to feel like we live in a sustainable world where one, two percent of the population lives as we do and the rest do not? Um, I think we have to ask that question um, if, we're, if we're serious about what we say we're serious about. That's it.
Okay. There's, there's two responses you could have to the first part of this presentation. Is you, could, you could curl up into a ball in the fetal position and say, it's too big, we can't do anything. I choose to take a different response and say, no, actually, we can have a lot of impact. And the example of the Faraday Cafe proves that, is that we might be one firm in Vancouver, but you know what? People listen to what's happening in Vancouver. They pay attention to it. And if we, if we advocate for the types of change that's needed, we can have, we can have, have an impact. I think that, um, I don't think we're going to get a political solution. I'm, but to be honest, I'm not convinced we've got a political structure that will support the type of change that's necessary. It's part of the reason why, why we're not relying on that, right? There, nobody's got a plan. Nobody, nobody's got a plan that says this is how we're going to get from here to here and this is everyone's share. They're, they're making promises that they're pushing further and further out into the future that are filled with so many holes. And again, nobody's asking the really critical questions. Is it enough? Is it fast enough? And we know the answer to that intuitively. So uh, for me, you know, the effects of climate change aren't acute enough yet, if, which is shocking when you consider, you know, polar ice caps and, you know, extreme weather and all of the things that, that now is the new normal. Um, it's not acute enough yet to drive the political will to, for the type of change. So I think those of us that are engaged in the conversation, those of us that are, are committed to it, need to, we need to stand up. And that's what we're doing as a firm. We're saying, no, we're going to take a stand. We're going to, we're going to put our voice out there um, and hope others do as well. So I think that right now we're going to have more impact through grassroots and through people demanding change than we are through the political avenues, unfortunately. And that's part of the reason why we created Tilt. Because, you know, it's somewhat arm's length from, from our firm. And that's very deliberate because, you know, it'd be one thing for another architectural firm to get behind some of the things we're doing with Tilt. Say, well, why are we promoting HCMA? It's like, it's not about promotion of HCMA. It's about asking questions. It's about getting people to understand their cities. So we've created it as a vehicle for others to get involved with, others to contribute to. Because I think the more voices we can bring to the table, whether it be, you know, engineering firms, architectural firms, members of the public, you know, tech industries, you know, I think we can, we can have as much impact through the things we do as a firm as we have through the th our, our, pro our projects. At least um, I know that we're having more impact by, by focusing on things that are more than just our, our, our buildings. And that makes me feel like we're doing what we can do. And ultimately, I think that's what we're all trying to do, is we're trying to you know, use, our, use, use our work as a way to make as big a difference uh, as we can. Uh, I think that maybe the good quote that I thought of when you were um, you were making your presentation today comes from uh, Thomas Moore, and he says one of the greatest tragedies is the man who did nothing because he thought he could only do a little. And, uh, so there you go. Do a, little bit, yeah. uh, a little, and maybe some change will happen. There, so. yeah. All right. Once again, thanks. Uh, thanks to Jerry. <laughs>